if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 8 this morning. And uh, as you're opening there, as I was um, thinking about this passage and this message today, and you know, reading over it and studying it and so forth, I was reminded of one of my best and worst, I think, experiences preaching. Uh, this was at the church that we were at previous to coming here. We were at a, a church in Raleigh that my wife and I uh, helped start. We were on staff there since 2017 before coming here. And uh, I remember one day I was, teach- I was preaching, and I was using this illustration of the Apollo 11 space mission. Now, which you, if you didn't know, the anniversary is in like a week or two weeks. It's the 55th anniversary, which is on everyone's calendar, I know. Um, <laughs> But I was talking about the, the guys that were on the mission, and there were three guys on the mission. There was Buzz Aldrin, uh, Neil Armstrong, and does anyone know the name of the third person? No, nobody ever does. Um, it's a guy named um, Michael Collins. Michael Collins. And his uh, story, oh, that, that, that's, that's what I'm getting to in a minute. So his story is um, that he was uh, part of the mission, but that he kind of uh, stayed back in, the, in, in lunar orbit as um, the other two went down to the moon. So he never actually walked on the moon. And I was using this, uh, th- this example to say that he was like so close to what, was, I, what had to have been this ultimate goal of his, but never quite made it. That I'm sure growing up, especially in that time, with uh, everything that was going on as an astronaut, I'm sure that the goal of walking on the moon had to have been like, the, the, the best thing you could possibly do. And he was on the mission that did it, which was great, but he never actually set foot on the moon. And so I was telling the story, and I was using it to illustrate that we were talking about hypocrisy. I was talking about how we can often um, appear so close to Jesus, but in reality, we're so far away. And I talked about how he was so close to this uh, goal of being on the moon, but never quite made it. And to be honest, I kind of painted him a little bit as a failure about how, oh, it must have burned him up inside. The other guys did it, and he didn't, and, and so forth. And, and I finished my illustration, went out with the message, and, and that was that. And that was on Sunday. And then three days later, on Wednesday, I get a text with an article that is on the screen right now. Three days later, he dies. Now, look, he's not the most famous person in the world. He's probably not being used as an illustration in churches across the nation every Sunday. But the week that I talk about him, the two days later, he dies. And I talk about him in a negative light. I talk about how big of a failure he was. And so I felt so terrible when this happened. A couple weeks later, I got the opportunity to teach again, and I got up, and I was just, I, I listed off, a, I read off a list of everything that he's done and accomplished and issued an apology to his family who will never in a million years see anything from this little church in, in Raleigh and this, this, this nobody talking about him. But I felt so terrible that I painted this guy in such a negative light, and then he dies. So that was that was what was going through my mind as I was prepping this message. Because one thing I learned when I was reading about Psalm 8 is that it is one of two passages that were actually read on the surface of the moon, which I had no idea. I've learned. I I grew up in a Christian school. I learned about the moon at some point, and never once did I ever hear that there was Bible verses right on the moon. I had no idea. So apparently what happened is Buzz, Buzz Aldrin, I guess was an ordained um, Presbyterian minister, I believe it was, and so while he was on the moon, he read a passage from John 15 about Jesus being the true vine, and then he took communion. I don't know how that works. I, I must have been in the, I don't know if it was in the ship or not. I don't know how he'd take communion on the moon, but he did, and then he read a, a portion from Psalm 8, which begs the question, why? Why Psalm 8? It's not the most well-known psalm. It's not Psalm 23 or anything like that. So why this maybe seemingly a little bit obscure psalm to some of us, why did he pick that to read it on the moon? Why is this psalm so important? Well, we're going to do our best to answer that question today. Of what's, what's the significance of this psalm? What importance does it play in our lives today, and what can we learn from it? Uh, so if you've got a Bible with you, the, we're going to be reading through Psalm 8. We're just going to read through the whole thing. It's a, little bit, it's, it's a little short. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to go back through, and we're going to look at it verse by verse to see what we can learn from it today. So Psalm chapter 8, starting in verse 1, says this. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. 
When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Uh, before we dive into this and, and look at it in a little bit of detail, let's take a moment and pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can read these, that we can, we can read them and learn from them and spend time discussing them. God, I pray you be with us this morning. Uh, speak to us, God. Give us open ears and open hearts to hear what you have to say. God, I pray you be with me. Help me communicate clearly for you. God, help me to bring attention to you and not to myself. God, be with us this morning. We thank you. We thank you for your son, and we pray in his name. Amen. So before we dive into the Psalms, I think it's important for us to take a minute and talk about what the Psalms are. Uh, we can often look at these as 150 individual works that are just individual works. You know, oftentimes, uh, you may have done this before, and I've done it certainly many times in the past, where you maybe read a psalm a day, or just go to certain psalms and things like that. But we can often look at them as just kind of 150 disconnected poems. But in reality, they're actually much more interconnected than that than we think. So the, the work of the psalms is actually five different books. Uh, five different books. And what we're going to be looking at today, Psalm 8, is part of book chapter 1. So you have the psalms. They're separated into five books. We're going to be looking at book chapter 1, which is separated into five sections. Um, and the first section of the first book is chapters 1 and 2. Ch chapters 1 and 2, and this talks about the idea that God will deal with the wickedness of the world by sending a coming Messiah from the family lineage of David. Then the next section is, um, is section 2 is Psalms 3 through 14. And Psalm 8 falls right in the center of this. So the first part, Psalms 3 through 7, it, it talks about David's past when he was, uh, when he was powerless. And it talks about um, uh, David's basically crying out to God to restore him as king and to deal with the, um, the wicked rulers and those that are oppressing him. Then 9 through 14, the focus turns to people alongside David that he refers to as the oppressed and the needy. And he's, he's doing the same. He's, he's crying out to God to deal with the powerless, or I'm sorry, deal with the powerful rulers that are oppressing them. So 3 through 7, he's uh, talking about his own weakness. 9 through 14, he's talking about the weakness of the people around him, and Psalm 8 is right in the middle of it. And Psalm 8 is where we see the importance of those that are weak. And so we're going to dive into it again, and we're going to read through it verse by verse, starting in verse 1. And it says this. It says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Now you may have noticed, as we read it before, Psalm 8, verse 1 and verse 9 start and end with the exact same phrase. Uh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And what this is, is this is called an inclusio. This is, this is a literary device that basically puts a bracket around a section of verses or a chapter or a poem. And it's telling you, it's signaling that, hey, everything within this bracket, this is the theme of it. So if we're ever reading scripture and you see a, a, a section start with a phrase and end with the exact same phrase, it's basically, it's the author, it's the psalmist telling you everything that you're going to read in here is dealing with this main idea. And so while mankind is talked about throughout this section, the focus isn't on the greatness of man, but it's on the greatness of God. Or in other words, we could say this, that the idea of this chapter is that the Lord is majestic over all the earth. That's the grand idea of this chapter, that the Lord is majestic over all the earth. And we'll continue to see that idea throughout the entire chapter. So continuing in verse 2. It says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So the translation that we read says that through the praise of children and infants, but a more literal translation would say from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. And what comes from the mouths of infants and nursing babies? Babble, right? Nonsense, nothing, noise. Nothing coherence, nothing of value. And even if you look at children that are a little bit older, as, as kids get a little bit older, they, they, they may form words, they more, may form like coherent sentences, but generally not words of wisdom to build a stronghold and a fortress on. 
And it makes me think of uh, my son. We have a four-year-old son. He's great. Um, he uh, speaks very well. He's hilarious. But one thing that he's really gotten into lately is the show Bluey. Does anyone have kids that watch Bluey? Tell me somebody, because I'm going to talk about it for a while. Um, it, Bluey is great. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Australian show about a family of Australian blue healer dogs, and it's hilarious. Like, as an adult, it's hilarious. And it's thought-provoking, and, I mean, there's been episodes where I, like, have to hide that I'm about to be in tears, and it's, it's great. It's wonderful. In fact, they just came out with an episode that was 20 minutes long. They're usually eight minutes, and I, like, for days, was like, dude, do you want to watch Bluey with me? Like, can, I feel weird watching this after you go to bed. I need someone to watch it with. And it was great, and I cried, and it was wonderful. But it's, Bluey is, takes place in Australia. So they speak English, but they have different phrases than we do, obviously. And so as an adult seeing that, you can recognize the differences, but as a child hearing those things, you recognize that it's English, but you don't necessarily always know that, hey, this is different than the way that we talk at home or that the, different than the way that people talk around me. And I didn't realize that this was becoming uh, something that he was catching on to, until a couple weeks ago, we were out and we were fishing and brought a snack for him, asked him if he wanted the snack, and he said no. And so I made the biggest, um, uh, the, the rookiest of rookie dad moves where I then ate the snack because I was hungry. <laughs> and, and then 10 minutes later, he's like, Dad, can I have that snack now? I was like, bud, I'm sorry. It was the only one and I ate it. And he wasn't like mad or anything, but he responds and he goes, oh, he goes you're a cheeky daddy. <laughs> I was like, it caught me off guard. I was like, I'm a what? It's like, you're being cheeky. And I was like, buddy, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know either, but you probably shouldn't call me that. Um, but he's starting to, to catch on these little Australian phrases. Uh, he, he's going on vacation next week, and he's been talking about how he's excited to go on holiday. Like, buddy, we're in America. We go on vacation. We don't go on holiday. <laughs> but... But this is kind of the stuff that this verse is talking about. It's talking about from the mouths of infants, from children, the, the, those that would not be looked at as saying something wise or meaningful, you have established a stronghold or a fortress against your enemies. What in the world does that even mean? It sounds interesting, it sounds cool, but in reality, what in the world does that even mean? Let's continue reading in verse 3 and see if it becomes a little more clear. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. So what's happening here is these verses are echoing the creation story, the creation narrative, where God created these heavenly beings, the sun, the moon, the stars, and then he creates humans out of dirt. And so the psalmist is saying that God you, you, you created these massively incredible celestial beings that I don't understand, but these incredible, wonderful creation. However, you seem to care most for us, for man, for mankind, the ones that you created out of dirt. Why? Why do you care so much about these little dirt creatures? And that's what he's saying. Why do you care so much about us? The psalmist honestly knows nothing of galaxies, of space. Anyone in here up against David could school him on space knowledge. He knows nothing about what he's looking at. I am the biggest dummy when it comes to space. I think it's very cool and interesting. And I, we love talking about space stuff. The other day, Theo asked if I would please go to the store and buy him a jetpack that would fly into the moon. Like, buddy, I would if I could. But I, I think it's so cool. I don't understand it at all. It makes no sense. I don't, I don't know anything. Even me, up against David, I know so much more than he knew about what's actually out there, about galaxies, about space, and things like that. But even in the limited knowledge that he had, just from being able to look up, he could see that humans, compared to what he sees, humans are so low, are so weak, are so feeble, are so broken. But God is so mindful of us. Why? So he continues as we finish the rest of this chapter. You have made them talking about humans, mankind. You have made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and all the, wild anim all the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, 
how majestic is your name in all the earth. So the idea that the psalmist is getting here is that we, as humans, are made in the image of God. That's the, that's the, that's the overall idea that he's getting at. But, as we're asking a lot today, what does that even mean? Like, if you've grown up in church, if you've been in church for a long time, you've probably heard the idea that we, are, as humans, are created in the image of God. I've set it up here many times. But we don't often define what that actually means. So what in the world does it mean to be made in the image of God? When I was growing up, I just assumed that meant that we look like God. Uh, it, it would make sense to me to say that a child is made in the image of their parents, and a child kind of looks like their parents, so that must mean that we look like God. In fact, in cartoons, when he, God is portrayed, he often has personified features, so it makes sense. But then I started thinking, well, we all look different. And we all, some of us look very different from each other. So if being made in the image of God means we look like him, then that must mean that some of us are made more in the image of God than others. And that doesn't really seem right. So what in the world does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, the idea of the image of God is not a unique one to the Bible. It's not, not found anywhere else outside of the Bible. In fact, in ancient times, kings would refer to themselves as images of God or as gods themselves. And then they would build images of themselves, of themselves as gods, which were called idols. In fact, this is why the Israelites were instructed not to build images of God or idols to God, because God's image was already on earth in mankind. However, when God created the earth, he showed, what, what he did is he showed that he had ultimate power over creation. Ultimate power over everything. By, by the act of creation, he had power over all. And the last thing he did was he created humans. These little creatures out of dirt. That was the last thing he did, and he gave them a job. And the job that he gave them, we read about in Psalm 8, but what Psalm 8 does is it mirrors Genesis 1. So let's look at Genesis 1. These verses will actually be on the screen. You can read along with them there. Genesis 1, starting in verse 26, says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So being made in the image of God has nothing to do with our appearance. It's that humans were essentially given the job that only God previously had that only God could do. So God, when, when he, only God could harness and subdue creation, which he did when he created the earth, when he created all things. And then this job was then bestowed upon humans. He's saying, act on my behalf. Rule over this massive, incredible thing called creation, called earth. Rule over it, subdue it. Put it under your feet, which means to take control and rule over it. And this is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. It's exactly what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying you don't just care for your little dirt creatures. You actually elevated them and put everything under their feet. Even though mankind is so lowly and weak and feeble, God, you are so mindful of us that you made us rule over all creation, something that was only something that you could do. So, why? Why, God, why have you created us in your image to rule over everything despite our lowly status in nature? And what we can see from this psalm, but we can also see throughout all of Scripture, is that God uses the weak. God uses the weak to accomplish his will. Just like David in chapters 3 through 7, and the oppressed and the needy in chapters 9 through 14, and what we read about right here in the middle in chapter 8, God chooses and uses the weak to carry out his will. And this is not just talking about us. But in the first two chapters of the Psalms, he's referring to the coming Messiah as well. And, 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 and to see that, to kind of see how that plays out a little bit, we're going to look forward to the book of Matthew. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 21, look a little bit at Jesus' life to see the importance of those that are weak. So in Matthew 21, we see Jesus coming to Jerusalem. This is towards the end of his earthly ministry. And what he's doing is he's, he's entering into Jerusalem. But he does, it, he does it not as any earthly king would, where he'd come in on a royal horse on a, uh, with, with um, a bunch of people praising him and so forth and coming in in a royal fashion. But he comes in 
on a lowly donkey. And he's welcomed by the weak and children. And we see this in Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 14. It says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple. This is just after he enters Jerusalem. And he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you, Lord, have called forth your praise? You see, this is, this is like peak Jesus right here. This is like quintessential Jesus. Because what happen, what's happening is the, the, uh, the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they are the ones that know the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, or and what, what we call the Old Testament, better than anyone else on the planet. They would have spent their whole lives studying it, uh, teaching it, meditating on it, memorizing it. And they come to him and they're saying, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus responds with, yes. Have you never read the Bible? Have you ever read the thing that you've spent your whole life studying? Because then he refers back to Psalm 8, verse 2. From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. See, this idea of elevating the weak and the powerless is, is, is kind of like the definition of Jesus' ministry. In fact, we, we see in Matthew 18 a, chapter, a, 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 a conversation that he has with his disciples where he, where he basically says this flat out in Matthew 18, starting in verse 1. It says, At that time, his disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed a child among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And you see, this is why Christian influencer culture seems so strange to me. Because Jesus doesn't tell his followers to promote themselves, to promote their brand, to elevate themselves, to, to make sure everyone knows who they are. He tells them to take the position of a child, to humble themselves, to lower themselves to the lowest possible place before the Lord, to bring the attention to him, not to themselves. And are we doing that? Am I doing that? Is that the way we are living our lives as we're walking with Jesus? Are we willing to admit that we don't know something, that we don't know everything, that we can't do it all on our own? Are we willing to take the position of a child? And I think that we can think about it this way, is that to follow Jesus is to become like a child. To follow Jesus is to become like a child, not to gain power, not to gain notoriety. It's to lower yourself to the lowest possible status and to become like a child before the Lord. You know, one of the best parts of having uh, a, a child that's in that four-year-old stage is he is very um, uh, okay with admitting that he doesn't know everything. He is very okay with admitting that he doesn't know everything. In fact, if you ask him something he doesn't know, he'll just say, I don't know. If he says something, buddy, what does that mean? I don't know. There's no shame in it. There's no embarrassment. He doesn't try and hide it. I don't know. I'm four. I, I don't know. I don't know everything. <laughs> but he's trying to figure things out. It's, it's fun to see like his brain working. The other day he came up to us and he's like, Mom, Dad, does, does your brain remote control your arms? <laughs> like, Yes! It does. What a genius way to think about it. Yes, your brain has a little remote control and it controls your arms and legs and everything. He's like, oh, okay. But he, he, there's all these things that he doesn't understand and he has no problem admitting it. There's no shame in it. He doesn't hide it. No, I don't know. That's okay. And I think that's one of these childlike attributes that we as Christians need to embrace. Being able to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to everything. But thankfully, I worship somebody that does. I worship somebody that does, and he doesn't require me to know everything. He doesn't require me to learn every single thing before following him. He doesn't ask us to know everything before following him. He just asks us to take the position of a child, acknowledge our lowly status before him, and follow the one that does. And thankfully, we don't have to do it blindly. We have the perfect example of someone humbling themselves in Jesus himself. 
See, this is what Jesus did in his ministry. He lowered himself to the position of a small, weak, dependent baby. See, when Jesus came, he came as a real baby. He didn't come out, he didn't come doing miracles as a baby or come out just knowing everything as a baby. He came out dependent on his parents. He took the position of a child, and that's what he asked us to do too. He cared for the sick and the lowly. He used those with no social status. He was opposed by the powerful. He even lowered himself by submitting to a humiliating and painful death. However, through this act of lowliness, he defeated death and put death and evil under his feet. And this is what God asks of us, not to elevate ourselves, but to lower ourselves. See, I could, I could, I could show you dozens and dozens and dozens of books and companies and people who have built careers around the idea of trying to get Christians to elevate themselves. How can you become more powerful and influential? But I could not show you that many that show believers how to become like a baby, how to become like a child how to just say, I don't know, in the face of questions that we don't actually know. And, but this is what God asks of us, to not elevate ourselves, but to lower ourselves so that he can be elevated. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is Paul writing, and he illustrates this so well. And we'll close with this today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is Paul talking about himself. He says, I, starting in verse 5, he says, I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. I love that line. He's, he's, he's like, even if I were to boast, you know what? I have every right to. Look at all I've accomplished. If I were to boast, I wouldn't be lying. However, I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surprisingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. This is one of those times we can say, I don't know. I don't know what a thorn in the flesh is. Neither does anybody else. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, God has already elevated us. As humans, he has already elevated us. And he is the most high, and our job is to humble ourselves before him. To admit our weakness. To embrace our weakness. To realize we don't know everything, and that we are in need of a Savior. And so to acknowledge our lowly state this morning, the verse that we are going to commit to memory together is a verse that acknowledges how high and mighty the Lord is. It's the inclusio. It's the beginning of verse 1, and it's verse 9. And so if you're new with us, if you haven't seen throughout the Psalms, the series, we've been taking a verse or a section of verses each week and trying to commit them to memory. We're going to recite them out loud together, we're going to remove some words, recite it out loud together. We're going to remove all the words, recite it out loud together. And the point of this is not just to uh, try and see if we can get all the words right by the end. The point of this is to try and commit these words to memory. Because imagine if we were to wake up every single morning this week, and the first thing that we did, the first thing that came to mind was not to grab the phone, was not to think, what, do I, what can I accomplish today? How can I make today better than yesterday? What can I do for myself today? How can I elevate myself today? But the first thing that came across our mind was, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we took a position throughout the day of humbling ourselves before the Lord. So we're going to read this out loud together. We're going to read it out loud together. We're going to read it a couple times, and then we'll try and commit this to memory. So if you would, all together, out loud. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's the easiest one of the series. Let's do it again. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. All right, let's take away some words. Lord, our Lord, 
How majestic is your name in all the earth? One more time before we take it all away. Never mind. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Now take the words away and you guys go ahead. Let that be what we remember this week. Not how great we are, not all the great things that I've done, not anything like that, but how great the Lord is. And let us remember that, and in honor of that, take a position of weakness as a baby, as a child before the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can take a position of a child before you. God, the, the, the fact of the matter is, you don't just ask us to become a child and, be, and, and take a position of weakness, but you do so because we can rely on your power. That your power is sufficient and is so much greater than ours. God, I thank you that we have someone to depend on. That we have someone we can rely on who is far stronger, far greater, far better than we could ever be. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the humble sacrifice he gave in giving his life for us. Something that we don't deserve. Did nothing to earn, but was given so freely. God, that is a gift that we can never repay. But thankfully, you don't ask us to. You just ask us to humble ourselves before you to follow you as a child. God, we love you. We pray in your son's name.